I am Dr. Jason Johnson, one of the Pediatric Cardiology Fellows at Duke University, and this is a video annotated PowerPoint on Total Anomalous Pulmonary Venous Return, or TAPVR. This presentation will go over the characteristics of total anomalous pulmonary venous return and the pathophysiology, including the clinical features. I will also discuss how the diagnosis of TAPVR is made and the management of these patients. As you might expect, we will focus on total anomalous pulmonary venous return as a form of congenital heart disease. Total anomalous pulmonary venous return, or TAPVR, is a form of cyanotic congenital heart disease. It is the fifth most common form of cyanotic congenital heart disease. The incidence is reported to be 1 per 10,000 live births. TAPVR is defined by all four pulmonary veins failing to make their normal connection to the left atrium. There is a form of congenital heart disease called partial anomalous pulmonary venous return where some of the pulmonary veins return normally to the left atrium and some connect to the systemic venous system. We will not discuss partial anomalous pulmonary venous return during this presentation. In total anomalous pulmonary venous return, the pulmonary veins connect to the right atrium in multiple ways. The supracardiac type is the most common with 50% of all types. The pulmonary veins eventually connect to the superior vena cava via a vertical vein. In the cardiac type, the pulmonary veins connect to the coronary sinus or directly to the right atrium. This makes up 20% of the types. In the infracardiac type, the pulmonary veins connect via a descending vein to the inferior vena cava. This makes up 25% of the types. The mixed type is the most rare at only 5%. And the mixed type, the veins connect in various different ways. This is a figure that visualizes the different types of total anomalous pulmonary venous return. The image at the top left shows a supracardiac TAPVR. All the pulmonary veins collect in a common channel behind the left atrium. From there, blood courses upward to the left innominate vein via a vertical vein. Then blood flows to the superior vena cava and re-enters the heart at the right atrium. All blood entering the left atrium passes across the atrial septum from right to the left atrium. The image on the top right shows infradiaphragmatic total anomalous veins. All the pulmonary veins collect behind the left atrium and through a common channel proceed through the diaphragm to the portal or hepatic vein. And from there, empty into the inferior vena cava and ultimately the right atrium. The image on the bottom left shows total anomalous pulmonary venous return to the coronary sinus or cardiac type. All the pulmonary veins collect behind the left atrium and enter into the coronary sinus. The image on the bottom right shows mixed type of TAPVR. There are multiple variations of this anatomy. All pulmonary veins ultimately drain into the right atrium, with all blood entering the left atrium through the patent foramen ovale. In this example, the left veins course upward to the left innominate vein and down the superior vena cava to the right atrium, whereas the right pulmonary veins drain directly into the right atrium. The pathophysiology of total anomalous pulmonary venous return is characterized by the entire oxygenated pulmonary venous return mixing with deoxygenated blood from the systemic venous return. This results in total body desaturation or cyanosis due to the right-to-left shunt at the atrium. Because of this, 
all chambers of the heart are equally desaturated. The right atrium receives both blood from the pulmonary and systemic venous return, and therefore the right atrium and ventricle become dilated. The amount of cyanosis is determined by the level of obstruction to pulmonary venous return. When there is no obstruction, there is mild cyanosis. But when there is severe obstruction, there is severe cyanosis. There are two major clinical patterns of total anomalous pulmonary venous return that depend upon the presence or absence of obstruction to the pulmonary venous return. This point is very important in the management of patients with TAPVR. Neonates with severe obstruction to pulmonary venous return present with severe cyanosis and respiratory distress at one to two days of life. This is most prevalent in the infracardiac group and typically occurs where the anomalous vein courses through the diaphragm. Neonates are severely ill and fail to respond to mechanical ventilation. Sometimes this lesion can be missed and patients are incorrectly diagnosed with persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. The second heart sound is prominent. There is low blood pressure and diminished pulses with severe obstruction resulting in low systemic blood flow. Rapid diagnosis and surgical correction are necessary for survival. This is the one lesion where surgical correction is the only option. Patients can be placed on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO, which is essentially a heart-lung machine that keeps the patient stable until surgical correction can be performed. Now, in contrast to the presentation of neonates with severe obstruction, neonates with mild or no obstruction to pulmonary venous return may not present acutely. These patients typically present with heart failure as the pulmonary vascular resistance falls, which occurs around one to two months of age. Patients will have mild to moderate cyanosis, which could be missed in the immediate newborn period. On physical exam, there is a fixed split second heart sound due to right ventricular overload, and there is also a systolic ejection murmur due to increased stroke volume across the pulmonary valve. There is also a diastolic rumble due to increased flow across the tricuspid valve and hepatomegaly due to right-sided heart failure. Tachypnea is typically present due to the pulmonary overcirculation. As we discussed on the previous slides, making the diagnosis of TAPVR in a timely manner is extremely important. A 12-lead electrocardiogram shows right ventricular hypertrophy. A chest X-ray has different appearances depending upon the age of the patient. In neonates with marked pulmonary venous obstruction, it demonstrates a perihilar pattern of pulmonary edema with a small heart. In older children, a large supracardiac shadow and a normal cardiac shadow forms a snowman appearance. The modality of choice is a transthoracic echocardiogram, which can diagnose most cases of TAPVR. In complicated cases, or when the echocardiogram does not completely identify the anatomy, a cardiac catheterization or computed tomography angiography is utilized. These images are examples of chest X-rays in patients with total anomalous pulmonary venous return. The image on the left is a chest X-ray of a patient with supracardiac TAPVR. There is cardiomegaly with an enlarged right atrium and widening of the mediastinum, which gives the X-ray the snowman appearance. There is increased pulmonary arterial blood flow and hyperaeration of the lungs. As you can see, this is not a happy snowman or chest x-ray. The image on the right is a chest x-ray of a patient with infracardiac TAPVR showing diffuse reticular pulmonary opacities and small left pleural effusion. The next image is an example of infracardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous return below the diaphragm. 
This actually shows the post-mortem injection of contrast material into the portal system with an anterior-posterior view and lateral view, filling the pulmonary veins and portal drainage. Note the point of obstruction designated by the arrow at approximately the point where the common pulmonary venous channel pierces the diaphragm. These images should also remind you that infracardiac TAPVR with obstruction is a surgical emergency and patients can die from this lesion. The only successful management of these patients is surgical correction. As we have discussed earlier, surgical management may be an emergent need in patients with obstructed physiology. The medical management depends upon the level of obstruction to pulmonary venous return. In patients with obstructed veins, you can give the patient supplemental oxygen, try mechanical ventilation, and ionotropic support. However, I hope this point is hammered home that surgical repair is needed as soon as possible. In patients with unobstructed veins, you would treat pulmonary overcirculation with diuretics, and the surgical repair can wait until one to two months if needed. These are references to several book chapters that summarize total anomalous pulmonary venous return for your further reading. Thank you for your time.